and uh, you know, this gets into something, a great segue into Lost in the Sound of Separation, because one of the things that I find most impressive about that record in that era, retroactively, but also at the time, because I remember, you know, I, I, we have a lot of mutual friends and relationships in terms of your management and uh, record label especially. And that was a moment where coming off the success of the two prior albums, you could have, you would certainly have been forgiven for pivoting into a more commercial zone, right? Like being like, okay, it's getting bigger and bigger. And that tends to be what a lot of bands do in that moment, you know, and trying to do like radio hits and shorter songs and whatever. And I remember at the time just being like, man, these dudes are, <laughs> they have every opportunity to be some huge screamo band and they're making like a Hydrahead record. <laughs> yeah. Know, like, but that's what um, we I were. I'm just being like, wow. Like it just, it's punk, you know, it's ballsy. But that's, but that's what we were into. And I don't think we were trying to be ballsy. I just think like, honestly, at that time, as far as heavy music went, um, you know, granted, it's like, I'm still listening to Coldplay and my iPod riding down the van, you know, riding down the highway. But like, as far as heavy music went, you know, like, we were huge botch fans and isis fans and converge yeah. and old man gloom and all that cool they get a lot of that hydra head shit like and i think some of that did influence us heavily enough to continue down that you know we all have different musical tastes but we all had a couple of things in common that we loved you know be it jimmy Eat world and down to you know isis and you know which is a name you can't say now but you know <laughs> not a you know, not a hoodie you want to wear <laughs> yeah um but um, but we all did agree on, on those bands and like Radiohead and like we, um, I don't think we even thought that of anything about what a big screamo success could be because to us, we were still underground. We didn't think there was such a thing as mainstream success. We didn't think even if there was, and I'm not shit talking. I think we could all agree here. Even if I put the record label on on the spot here, is I don't think any of us thought that was a possibility. From if you were if you were on tooth and nail, and you were a band that was heavy, you know, like back then. Like I yeah. just don't think that that was a thought process of like we didn't go in thinking like let's not make a commercial sounding record or let's make a commercial sounding record. I think we just rolled in off of two years of touring and go, what's next? Let's make music that we really want to hear. And that's what I think is so great about the purity of it and about a lot of the bands that I love and the ones that stand the test of time because I think that the band could have pivoted then to the direction of like, you know, and this is these are great bands, but just in terms of, of the difference stylistically, you could have pivoted to like The Used or My Chem or, you know, and certainly that was a moment where Avenged and Fallout Boy and all these bands that had come from similar backgrounds were on TRL right. and like really blowing up. And I thought it was cool that you took the true to yourselves, double down on on what you are instead of you know going but, that. And I think it's and I think and it's I, in terms of longevity, you know. Yeah, and I think looking back on it, it makes us seem like we're really cool, but we're not. Like we weren't thinking <laughs> of that. We were. And we weren't trying to like prove a point and be punk rock. Like, I just think it was just like, yeah, two years of touring to find the great line. Like what's next? Our natural evolution was like more art, like, like expressing yeah. ourselves more artistically. And we just thought that's what we wanted to do at the time. And we did, we didn't even think twice about it. You know, like I think now there's a lot more thinking and people are a lot more connected and it's a lot easier to get a lot of music. Like back then you had to go vinyl hunting to get some of the bands we just spoke about. You know? sure. and, like, catching them in a live show was almost like a private event. You felt mm -hmm. fucking cool. You know, yeah. like, you're like, damn, I just fucking saw Old Man Gloom. That doesn't happen very often. Which <laughs> it didn't, you know, like, yeah. it's cool. Like, you know, like, uh, K, you know, Caven knows who we are. Like, that, you know, and like, we were bigger, maybe, at the time, but we didn't think like that. You know, we right. were still just like, I think the thing about Under Oath is we've always been, still, we're like fans you know, like, we're fans, like, even our bands, like, I fucking will never forget Poison the Well on the Define, the first Define the Great Line tour playing before us, and me just every night spent, no, like, this doesn't <laughs> right. make any sense, 
<laughs> yeah. and, 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 and even the Poison of the Well dudes are like, you guys are way bigger than us. I'm like, no, who are not? Like me and my friends grew up, listen, I was like listening to you and going to your shows. I was in the front row before I was even at, in Under Oath. Like, like, no, nah, this is back, like this is backwards. And it wasn't being humble. I was just, it just didn't make sense to me. And it wasn't an iPhone in your back pocket where you're scrolling and seeing how popular you are all the time. You know, it was right. just, it, we were just going and I was like, wait, so the Poison of the Well tour is like them playing before us? You know, like, that's yeah. like one of my favorite heavy bands. You know, Opposite of December was like, that's like the first time I was like, oh, wow, like screaming over like some melodic guitar. I was like, whoa, you know, like, yeah. I was always a singer. You know, I always sang, always sang. I didn't scream until... I got pushed into metal bands and I was singing and they're like, no, you got to do this. And I was like, oh, I'll figure it out, I guess. You know, like, you know, Poison the Well was one of the first bands that I heard do that, you know? And yeah. I was like, Jeffrey, dude. The yeah. Mark, the beast. Uh, and this takes us nicely into the Disambiguation record, which I remember came out uh, a couple days after my birthday that year, which was oh, nice. fascinating to people watching this. Uh, but <laughs> um, it seems like you continued down like I feel like that trio of records works almost as a nice trilogy of sorts you know there's a stylistic right. that runs through uh, them. Um, yeah. before we talk about the music on that record tell me about that symbol because that's when that definitive O started showing up in the under oath word and uh, enough that there has to be some kind of deep esoteric meaning to it. No, it's a, it was just a marketing thing that so from Tooth and Nail came up with and it actually had been around since Chasing Safety. Mm. It started getting used more regularly. It was always on our merch and it was cool. Like every, I thought it was awesome. Like I'm not a, you know, marketing guy or like a, a digital design type of person, but I think every band has a cool logo at some point, you know? Yeah. And I thought that was so cool that we had one, you know? Like, it's like yeah. uh, and, uh, yeah, it just worked. And, and I, you know, I've got one on me. Most of the guys in the band have tattoos, have one on them somewhere, you know. Yeah. I love when bands have a definitive symbol. And, and, it, and it works that, you know, you enunciate the letter O when you say the word under oath. So, it, yeah. it's, you know, even though you is the natural, it's like, I don't know. It, there's just something really cool about how that developed. Yeah, I, dude, that was, I, I, I don't remember the guy at the nail who, pinned that but i remember it being really cool and if i, I had to guess it. it was probably either jordan butcher or ryan clark yes it would have been one of those two i'll ask one of them so, yeah but uh, way, yeah it's pretty badass it was, either way it was a you know kind of that keep it simple stupid thing you know like yeah like there's nothing to it but it's powerful because it's simple and it makes sense so you the know, record before was Matt Goldman and then also um, Adam, Adam, Adam D. D from Killswitch, and then and I think I think uh, David Bendeth maybe mixed the record before. David Bendeth did mix Lost in Sound, yes. Okay, yeah, and then so, and then so this one it was just Matt Goldman producing, uh, and a different. Uh, and, Jer and Jeremy Griffith was also co-produced. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know much about Jeremy Griffith. So what was the? the it, he he's a badass man he uh he actually did the first couple of sleeping demos that no one ever heard that were better than anything that came out on broken compass in my opinion before it got like annihilated by a million different hands but um jeremy was he did a couple of, he did i know at least one or two norman Jean records that were phenomenal uh sounding and uh, a bunch of other cool stuff um uh, that now that I'm on the spot, I can't think of any of it. But Jeremy was great. I worked with him. We sang every day, you know, like constantly. And this was like peak of getting to be a peak of a really bad drug. You know, like I, I used to do drugs like at home. And then I started doing drugs on tour. Never before I played, you know, I was always, it was always after. And then it started becoming home and on tour, but not in the studio. But then on this record, it was home and on tour and in the studio. Yeah. And I was like recovering for the first half of the day. And then I would get up and then sing for six hours a day. And we would, we would demo every, all the vocals out while they were, they would work on music in one room and me and Jeremy would demo it all out. And then, then they would 
work on music more and then when the music was finalized and I'd re-sing it all. So I like, I mean, some of those songs I did like six and seven different choruses for and just, I just worked really hard and it was weird because I was in a really dark spot and like falling apart, I guess. But at the same time, like working my ass off, you know, and, yeah. and I listened to that. kind of twisted stuff though because it's like the one thing that's keeping you alive. All the cylinders and then everything yeah. else. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, yeah. It makes it twisted sense. Yeah, and I and I look back, I haven't listened to that record in a long time. We did a listen through on Twitch for some fans the other day. Yeah. You know? There's some songs on there that I'm not really into. Um, but overall I think the record's really cool and the and I was like I'm proud of the vocal work on that record is like I busted my ass, you know, and I think you can tell on, on that album. Now so the the, the dual producer thing then was that more split up between like one producer did the music and one did vocals with you or? No, it's normally like, it's a little bit of, they just, it just, Define the Great Line was Matt Goldman and Adam D. Lost in the Sound was Matt Goldman and Adam D. And then Disambiguation was Jeremy Griffith and Matt Goldman. It's just, there's six of us. And I think oh, we sure. have- two, <laughs> right. That makes sense. You know, <laughs> and I think having two rooms like Chris, Chris would work with Jeremy as well. Like we just had to have two rooms going because the budgets, you know, we didn't have major little budgets. So we had to have two rooms going constantly firing at both times to finish an album in the time that we had with the money that we had. So even though with all the success Under Oath had, we never really had that huge budget to just do whatever the fuck we wanted, you know? So I yeah. think we always had, you know, an A room and a B room firing on all cylinders. Chris would work every morning from, you know, from lunch till four or five in the afternoon. And the second five o'clock rolls around, we take a dinner break and then I would come in and work from 6.30 or seven until one or two in the morning or whatever. And the other room would be like drums and bass and then bass and guitar, whatever, you know, we were just nonstop. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we did for three records because we had to, you know? Yeah, I mean, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Yeah the beauty of, of limited resources, what it, what it can produce. Uh, even, you know, I always make the example of what John Carpenter was able to do with the original Halloween in a couple of weeks with no money compared to yeah. an excessive Halloween remake with millions of dollars, you know, and somehow it's like that first cheap one. And it's like, how much did the limited resources help make it great? You know, some of those, some of my, you know, my parents, my dad, especially, and was, Beatles and Zeppelin and the Stones and Pink Floyd and the Doors and all that stuff I, I was you know had to listen to and if I wanted to learn guitar I had to learn all the scales first and then I had to learn Led Zeppelin and be, you know that kind of stuff yes. like, yeah. was forced on me but the first shit that we got into outside of our parents influence uh, was the grunge era you know like Nirvana and Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and you know, Alice in Chains and, you know, all that Stuntable Pilots, all that shit. And a lot of those records, some of those records were made in like seven days, five days. Like some of the best records still that I go back and listen to when I want to listen to like rock. Some of those records were made with no money, no time. Yeah. And, 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 and live in the room. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know? Awesome. And it's just, it's awesome. There's something about that. Yeah. Uh, overthinking can, can kill I think the best songs, you know. I call it analysis paralysis. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> You've one. analyzed something to the to the point that you become frozen. We're near, we're, we're near really the finish great. line, by the way. Um, That's a great band name, analysis paralysis. <laughs> it would be great. It's got a nice little iambic pendameter. Um, so this was obviously the the first record without Aaron and the first record with Daniel. And I phrase it that way because I think those are almost two those are two separate thoughts, you know? Yeah. It had to be weird to make a record without Aaron, but at the same time, you're making a record with a totally different person who's bringing, you know, what he brings to the table. Um, I, 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 it's funny, I've actually always wanted to ask you this. It probably would have been off the record at any point before now, but it's been so long that I don't think it matters. Um, when Aaron left, and this isn't based on any conversations I ever had with Phil or anything, but just in the back of my mind, I always thought Phil would end up in Under Oath if Aaron were Aaron. Right. Um, why didn't that happen? I just don't think, I don't know. It, it just like, I think Tim, for example, just said like, 
let's not even go there. You know, like, I think there was something about, I don't know. I remember Tim just being like, when we first started talking about drummers, he was just like, shouldn't even go there. You know, don't mix if this doesn't end well. What if we bring them around to try out and it doesn't work out, you know, like, or we try out four other people and someone else fits better, you know? And I've always been the oddball and under oath. Uh, yeah. As far as, you know, oh, most things. And I think, I don't think he would have vibed well with those guys either. Cause it's hard for me at times. Like I've learned cause I grew up with them and we all have our special moments in relationships, but I'm, you know, you know, even a lot different than Phil. And I, I don't think Phil maybe would have fit in. And I think, I think Tim maybe was, I thought of it kind of as a disrespectful, but I think he was looking out for me. Yeah. You know, I, 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 think he, I can see that both sides of that too, especially now. And that's why it's good to talk about it now with all the hindsight. Um, yeah. I could see it upsetting the, I mean, as much as bringing in anyone new would, but especially given the blood relation. Yeah, I think... Upsetting sort of the chemistry of... I think it would have affected me and my brother's relationship if it didn't work out. And then, obviously... That's not worth trading in a million years. Yeah. Ask the Kinks or the Oasis or the Black Crows. (laughs) Yeah. And and then, like... It's not worth the bath. Yeah, and I I think that that was Tim seeing things clearer than I did at that time about a situation like that. And I didn't even really, I wasn't upset. I was just like, well, the band was really at a rift anyway before all that. And I was like, right. of course, this the motherfucker wouldn't want another version of right. similar to me around because we yeah. don't get along anyway. So, yeah. And I didn't really, I was like, all right, you know, I think some people in my family were confused, but I, I was like, at the same time, they weren't, they get it. You know, I think they, they've been around those guys enough to know that yeah you know and i think like you said in hindsight i think it was good because if for example it didn't you know they didn't vibe well with certain people or just you know the way those guys play and the way he plays doesn't line up better than someone else it would have been a really shitty situation you know yeah i mean even if even if it wasn't bad for your relationship with your brother then even whatever resentments might linger within the band on your part yeah, the rest of the okay. guys yeah. you know, aren't fair to him, or you know, yeah, it, it, yeah, that that makes total sense. I was just always curious because it 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 seems like a no brainer until you start thinking about it, and then it's not. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah um, it, I remember around that time too, or a couple of years before when I when I first was getting to know your brother, how many times at a show, especially like someone would stop him thinking he was you. <laughs> yeah. you know like oh do you, you're the singer from under oath right and i even always I, I would always hear him very calmly go like nope that's my brother though He's yeah my brother <laughs> so yeah that that would probably would have been a confusing band photo for some people <laughs> <laughs> uh but it was pre-blonde hair um yeah. pre-mustache on your brother 